Welcome to Bible Tract Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracts Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracts, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracts Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracts and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world, and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Good day to you, my friend. I hope you're having a great day. Thank you for joining us here at Bible Tract Echoes. We're having a good day. No matter what time of day it may be that you're listening to the broadcast, whether it's in the morning, in the afternoon, evening, maybe in the very dead of night, whatever the case may be, I hope that your day is beginning well or ending well or going well. Well, right now my Bible is open to the book of 2 Peter chapter 3. If at all possible, reach over, pick up your own copy of the Word of God and join me there. I'm going to begin to read at verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 3 in a moment, but verse 7 will be our highlight verse. I'm going to talk about some gospel tracts today. I'm going to highlight one of them in particular, and I will be encouraging you to get from us a free sample packet of gospel tracts. So having that pen and paper handy will enable you to jot down our contact information so that you can give to us your name and your mailing address. Let me lead into the Bible study this way. Now, if you were listening to our study time here in 2 Peter last week, then you more than likely heard me use this big word called uniformitarianism. Let me say that again, uniformitarianism. Now, that's a long word. It's a word used of people describing people who have a viewpoint concerning denying simple Bible truth, and in particular, the truth about the coming judgment on sinners by God. The word uniform, you know, it means that everything is the same. That's what uniform means. All those in a group, if they're uniform, they either look the same, act the same, or they think the same. Well, many people look at our world and say that over the vast centuries, nothing has ever changed. Therefore, they believe nothing ever will change. When this idea is applied to what they teach and believe about the Bible, and particularly the prophecy of God concerning judging sinners and bringing our life to an end, our world to an end, they say something like this. Well, the world, it will never happen. Judgment will never happen. Evil deeds and wicked people have always been around, and God has never done anything about it before, so God won't ever do anything about it in the future. And I really, frankly, doubt there is a God up there anyway. Well, that's what they I say or think. Well, today's Bible passage really confronts that thought pattern. Join me in 2 Peter, please, and chapter Three. I mentioned a gospel tract. That word tract is spelled T-R-A-C-T. I'm referring to a, an evangelism tool. A gospel tract is a short written presentation of God's plan of salvation. It's a, an evangelism tool you can hand to somebody even when you cannot verbally tell them the God's plan of how to be saved from their sin, how to have the gift of eternal life. These gospel tracts are used all over the world. They're a powerful tool. We know of over half a million people who've received Christ by receiving a gospel tract in the last 14 years. So please, no that it works. Now, the one at track in my hand right now is entitled Ready to Die. Ready to Die. It is a testimony track of a young man named James Dunkley who gave his life in the service of our country, serving in the, in the military, died in the Middle East in a wartime. But he lived a powerful life. When he was 14 years of age, he came up with this life motto, Ready to Die to die. He came up with his own logo. All this stuff is mentioned and shown in the gospel tract. What this tract does is really challenge young people to be living for God as a young person, but it also not only challenges the believer, but the lost that they need to be ready to die and face God. 
Ready to Die, just one of over 40 gospel tracks in that sample packet. At the end of the program, my announcer will give our contact information. Have your pen and paper ready. You can, by the way, go to our website and order the sample packet there. Our web address is www.bibletracksinc.org. If your Bible's open, 2 Peter 3, verse 3 begins this way. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men." Now, the Holy Spirit has spent all of chapter 2 of 2 Peter talking about false teachers, and I've also used the word apostates to describe them there. And there are a lot of people who do not believe the Bible, but an apostate, though, is one who teaches error about the Bible, but they also have clearly known what that truth is, and they have willfully denied it, denounced it. Chapter 3 begins with an assignment to all true believers in verses 1 and 2. Anybody living in an era when there are false teachers around, they are told to focus on the Word of God. Again, that's in verses 1 and 2. But then, beginning at verse 3, 3 through 7, we move from a focus on the Word of God to this word, first. That word, first, is used in verse 3, and it means above other things. What the Spirit of God is doing right now is shifting back to describing these false teachers. I have used four words, all beginning with the letter R, to form my outline of verses 3 through 7. I said verses 3 and 4 talk about the ridicule. That's my first R word, the ridicule. Ridicule is the chief way by which we can spot false teachers. They scoff and ridicule old-fashioned, clearly taught Bible truth. Then verse 5 says that they refuse. They refuse the Genesis 1 and 2 creation story. And in verse 6, these false teachers revile, that's another R word, the idea of God being a judge of sinners. In their view, God has never done it before. He's never judged sinners before. And then why in the world would he ever do it in the future? Well, verse 6 talks about the truth of the Noah flood. That flood was done to judge sin. So, by the way, that's why they have to find a way to deny a worldwide flood. When you find a Bible teacher, a religious teacher who denies the worldwide flood, they probably deny the future judgment of God. But that leads us to verse 7. If a religious teacher denies the flood of Noah and that it was done to judge the wickedness of that day, then those false teachers will deny, or to use my final R word, they will repudiate, based upon verse 7, they were going to repudiate that God will judge the world a second time in the future. Look at verse 7. Let me read it again. Here's what it says. The heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. If you are taking notes, please jot down these three points, all based upon verse 7. First of all, there is the word that is fixed. Notice the W word. There is the word that is fixed. Secondly, there is a woe that is fire. And thirdly, there are the wicked who are finished. First of all, let's deal with the word that is fixed. Notice verse 7 talks about the same word. Now, just as God spoke 
the world into existence according to Genesis chapter 1, and the way God designed the world made it ready for the flood of Noah's day, just as that happened, that same word, powerful word, was spoken by God, and God also made the physical world able to be used another time, another judgment time, for a final judgment time. God planned salvation before the world began, the Bible says, and he planned judgment on sin before the world began because he designed the world to be able to bring judgment on the world two times, one by water, one by fire. That word that is fixed is unchangeable. It's God's word. But then verse 7 moves to that woe, W-O-E, the woe, that judgment, that judgment woe that will be by fire. That's yet in the future. God created the world with a watery canopy to enable the flood judgment, but God has designed the world in such a way at the molecular level that it can be consumed by fire. Presently, God is holding the world together by his own power, Colossians tells us. This is going to go on until the day, the final day of judgment, and our physical world is reserved. It's kept in store for the day of fire and judgment. That is an awful woe. But then brings finally here, verse 7, reveals that the wicked are finished. The wicked are finished. Our world will be destroyed by fire as part of God's judgment on wicked people. They're called ungodly people at the end of verse 7. Let me ask you, friend, do people in their earthly lifetime ever get away with sin? Do they ever get away with criminal acts and are never caught and held accountable for it? Well, the answer is yes, some do. But friend, I remind you, that only means that they are not caught and they are not judged in their earthly time span. But in God's final judgment on sinners, every act will be revealed. Revelation chapter 20 says so. And as God's books are opened, everyone who has not received Jesus Christ as their Savior will receive their just and eternal judgment. They will be brought into judgment and found guilty and will have to endure perdition, verse 7 says. The word perdition means destruction. It means damnation. They will experience eternal, never-ending punishment in the place called the lake of fire. Revelation 20 says that. Now, friend, according to verse 7, you are either godly or you're ungodly. But friend, only Christ can make you godly. All it will cost you for Christ to make you godly is your total surrender, your capitulation of your entire life to him and have to surrender to your pride and your self-effort and say, I have nothing to offer. I must beg the mercy and grace of God to be forgiven and receive Christ and his shed blood of Calvary. That's how you move from being ungodly to be godly. You're given the status of godliness through the merits of Christ. Receive him right now. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.